The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to The Fold. This is a summer reissue of my episode from the middle of 2020 with Gaurav Sharma. This was one of my favourite episodes of the year. He is an Indian New Zealander, a migrant who had some quite powerful things to say, I think, about the New Zealand media and the way it relates to Indian New Zealanders and migrant communities in general. It's sometimes uneasy listening, but I think it's really important that we, as the media and as constituencies relate to it, hear this out. Um, My thanks to Vodafone for making the fold possible. Here is the episode with Gaurav. Kia ora and welcome to uh, another episode of The Fold. Um, I'm joined this uh, month by, by Gaurav Sharma, who is the associate editor of the Indian News and still the editor-in-chief of the, the Multicultural Times, uh, a, a journalist of, um, of real standing and, and someone I've, I've talked to a few times over the, the last couple of years about, uh, I guess, the state of... Um, the journalism as it pertains to kind of New Zealand's migrant or, or ethnic communities, which um, and he has a what I think is a really interesting and quite important theory of or, or lesson for mainstream media about um, how to meaningfully engage or, or, or what's not being done. And um, so, yeah, and yeah, we're, we're going to cover that and, and a whole bunch of other things. So, um, welcome to the show, Gaurav. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having. Me. Um, no, it's it's great to have you up here again. And um, I was wondering if you could start by just telling our our audience uh, who you are and 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 what you do. Actually, you covered everything. So as I said, uh, you said I'm a journalist. I'm not a trained journalist. I'm a mechanical engineer, and so I switched this prof- to this profession twelve years back. So I'm like you can say I was trained on the job. I started with a very uh, very courageous newspaper, so to say, in India. The tagline of that newspaper is Journalism of Courage. It's a very respected newspaper called Indian Express. So whatever I know in journalism, I was trained by them. So I was there for one and a half years. And then I moved to Singapore. I was there for five years. I did my journalism there. Singapore is sort of a police state. So majority of work that I did there was about business journalism. When I started talking about political and social issues, they told me to just get out of Singapore. And then I've been here in New Zealand since 2014. I was in Christchurch for three years. I moved to New Z- uh, Auckland in 2018. In Christchurch, I started a newspaper called The Migrant Times, in which idea was because, you know, Christchurch is very white, quote-unquote. So uh, the entire media there, not there's not much media there. You have press there, you have the Star Christchurch and some bureaus of other radio and TV publications. So I saw that the media there was for the whites, to the whites, by the whites, everything for the whites. Again, whenever I'm using white, it's within quotes, right? So I saw there was a big vacuum there. And so uh, we came up, me, when when I say me, me along with, so now it's closed, but at that time there was a Canterbury Migrant Center there. So I collaborated with Canterbury Migrant Center and we started a newspaper called The Migrant Times. And we used to cover each and other ethnicity, uh, including Pakihas in that newspaper. And people sort of liked that initiative. So, But, you know, our reach was very small. We were only distributing the newspaper across Canterbury. So not only in Christchurch, in Ashburton, in Selwyn, in uh, Waimakariri, those places. So people said, you know, this is such a nice thing and we need something like this on a national level, not only in Christchurch. So that led to uh, a the newspaper Multicultural Times. And to, you know, Auckland is the probably the only business hub in New Zealand. So if you want to do anything at a national level, you have to be in Auckland. So in 2000, mid-2018, I shifted to 
Auckland to launch that multicultural times. We we did it for a few months. Then you know some internal problem happened with the company, and we we went online. So we still do some stuff, but mainly online. We are not publishing the newspaper. And since last year, I, as you said, I have been working. So uh, people knew what I have been doing for a few years. So this newspaper, the Indian News, which is which was mainly looking into issues for the Kiwi Indian community, they called me up last year. You know, if I can help them revamp their editorial and everything. So to summarize, I brought my kind of journalism for diversity in this newspaper as well. So it's so the name is Indian News, and of course we cater to Indian community as well. But we have started covering Indian subcontinental communities in a big way. So we cover Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, Bhutanese, Nepalese community as well. And then we have started a section called Multiculturalism in this newspaper as well. So you will find in the twenty-four pages, one or two pages are devoted to that. Like for example, in the recent just uh, the paper that came out today. We have covered a story about the African Aitora African Foundation happening at 18th of July. Uh, Christchurch City Council buying the Christchurch Netball Centre to set up a multicultural hub in Christchurch. Things like that. So that's the short summary. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and why do you? I mean, if you look at the both the ventures that you've founded and what you brought to the Indian News. There is that that thread of representing kind of community, uh, you know, communities that maybe don't necessarily have as much visibility within uh, New Zealand's uh, mainstream media. Why why has that been such a sort of driving force for you through these various ventures? Because you know, I actually I have problem with this even this term that we use mainstream media mm. because I believe uh, that's why I. I also sometimes use it because people will not understand if I use the term I want to use, which is already established media. Like for example, for yeah, like your audience, young urban, twenty-five uh, to forty, right? For them, you spin-off might be mainstream. Uh, they will not be interested in what NZ Herald is saying, right? So. Instead of calling them mainstream media, I just want to call them already established media. So stuff is already established. Spinoff is in the process of establishing itself. So I I see that uh, this, as I said in the beginning, the vacuum that we have in the already established media is very, I mean, stupid, so to say. Because in one of the pieces I wrote that when you look at the uh, census 2018, you will find that. Uh, more than 25% to 30% of the population of New Zealand and particularly Auckland is non-Pakia. But the entire media, as I said in the beginning, is, is for the Pakia, by the Pakia, everything for the Pakia. And Pakias are the ones who are in the jobs. They are under employment. All of us know that migrants and non-Pakia people face huge discrimination when they go for jobs. So the invariable... Uh, option for them is to start their own ventures. And who are the advertisers? Those who have their own ventures. So I actually don't understand this, that 30% of your, 25% of your population is the migrant entrepreneur who is going to advertise and you're not talking about them and then you are hoping to succeed. I don't, I, I see there is a big stru- <laughs> stupidity going on here. And that's that's essentially why um I've got you up because I remember the first time that you articulated that to me, and you've you've done it and a number of times since. And I, I think because yeah, you know, one of and I'm so guilty of it. The the fact of this podcast is is um, testament to it. Is like one of the media's the already established and the startup media in New Zealand's chief preoccupations is itself um, and the travails of it. Because I think the um, we live with the sort of cultural and business memory of a much larger industry. Um, live with its ghost, the, the rivers of gold that were the classifieds, the um, you know, companies that were worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and certainly couldn't be sold for a dollar like stuff was yeah. a couple yeah. of months ago. And and yet, you know, and and so we we kind of scrutinize that and we we look at the rise of social media, we look at um, different ways uh, you know the you know, rise of tech competition for everything from Google to trade me. We look all across it and we're so familiar with these narratives, but the one that we never talk about, and I, I'm gu- as guilty of this as anyone, but is the one that you just mentioned, is that we, as a group, just there's a whole 
community of New Zealanders who just are not well served. Um, and it really means that the whole mainstream or already established or Pakeha media, however you want to frame it, is really fighting over 75% of the audience. And it's not just a dereliction of duty, I think I, I, you know, I recall you saying. It's also just a huge missed business opportunity. Exactly. That's the point I, I want to make. It's not only about dereliction of duty. It's more so about making... But see, you, you ultimately want to run a sustainable business, whether it's a media business or any other business, right? You remember we uh, interacted a bit last month uh, on Twitter about a photograph that Stuff, uh, Stuff published in which they were doing a migrant story and the migrant uh, was standing next to Simon Bridges and next to Simon Bridges was Kawaljeet Singh Bakshi. Now, he has been a MP in parliament since 2008. It has been 12 years. And in 120 or 121 MPs, he stands out because he wears, he is the only one wearing a turban, right? So it's not so difficult to have an institutional memory of somebody for uh, sick in, in New Zealand parliament, all, all the more when he has been there for two, 12 years, right? So this shows that stuff actually doesn't know what Kavaljit Bakshi is, right? He is there because he represents the Sikh community of New Zealand, right? Now all of us know what Sikh community did during the lockdown. You know, the free proof food parcel. You know, we did some uh, story in uh, for spin-off as well, right? So much so that parliament actually acknowledged their Sikh, the community, Sikh community's contribution in helping the community during the lockdown. So they are rich people, Right. If you go to Papa Toy Toy, you go to South Auckland, you will have five, six print publications written in Punjabi. You will have like five, six radios who are running just catering to six communities. So there is business. And your, your, uh, you, the importance you place on that business is you don't even know the Sikh MP who has been in the parliament for 12 years. So, I mean, I'm not talking about you are not doing your duty covering everyone. I mean, that I will talk about if you are not uh, talking about the Bhutanese community who are maybe a few hundreds or few thousand. But Sikh, I don't understand. That's why I don't know whether you uh, allow this la kind of language, but I use the word stupid, right? <laughs> because I, I, if, if uh, see, uh, stuff has a new CEO, uh, I mean, she should change that. At least, if nothing else, start covering the Sikh community. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, and I think it's I think it's such a good point, and it um, I think in some ways like the there is a a tendency to view sort of uh, diversity of creators and of subjects as um, something that the that is a nice to have or or a you know like something that you would love to do if you had more resource but i think the point that you make is that like if that these community like that almost the implication of that is that migrant communities are um you know they're without agency without money and yeah. and that there isn't a powerful incentive to do it when in fact as you point out you know that the 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 Indian community in New Zealand might be its most entrepreneurial on, on a per head per capita basis. Like the number of small and and often actually quite large businesses that are owned. Therefore, the the principals are decision makers. They are placing advertisements. You know, and whereas with you know with with you know with Pakia, they're much less likely to be that on a, on a demographic or per head of population basis. I, I just take two communities, right? So that's why we particularly are talking about the Indian community. Mm. Because if you look at two communities, you will say, okay, Indians and Chinese are the you know uh, biggest numbers of uh, migrants in New Zealand, right? Mm. But I understand if you don't look at Chinese because Chinese don't uh, know English that much, so though they have their own Chinese media, they're more focused on the Chinese media. But that logic doesn't actually at all apply to the Indian community because Indian community is a commonwealth, right? Mm. Like you learned English and English is a first language, not my first language, but I actually learned English along with Hindi all through my life, right? Mm. Same as with, I mean, if you talk to Indians across, I mean, India is such a huge country, so much diversity. If a North Indian is talking to a South Indian, they will talk in, in English because he will not understand Hindi. I will not understand Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam or whatever, right? So the point is, I mean, if you even want to concentrate in a uh, and look at your business, looking at Indian community makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, how does that sort of manifest itself? Like when you do see uh, the Indian community or see migrant communities covered 
in uh, the the already established media. Well, it's okay. You can call it mainstream that, media for the purpose the, of this I, part. I, I, think, I think it's quite useful. You know, I think yeah. it's a, it's, it's a, it is a useful way of um, sort of characterizing. Because the, the fact is, when we say mainstream, if we use it as code for Pakeha, we say that by implication, uh, you know, migrant New Zealanders are not, not mainstream. mainstream yeah, yeah. You know, and therefore it's an exclusionary word. And it's you know, you've got to think about these things yeah. about how they make people feel, how they land. So established, so already established media. Let's Fine. do it. <laughs> I think it's good. Um, so what I what I you know, and and I think there, there was a, a, another story that you told me about um, uh, an all woman, uh, a yeah, 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 Indian yeah. naval crew, which, yeah. which 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 went round the world. Stopped in Christchurch and used that as a sort of as a way of understanding which stories from sort of uh, migrant or, eth- or ethnic communities, because we're not just talking about migrants, are given um, prominence versus and, and how that, that impacts the Yeah, yeah. So that this is again, you know, stretching that point that we are talking about. Like, for example, firstly, there is no representation of anybody except the Pakiha community in the media. If at all you get a mention, that invariably be a negative story. So this example demonstrates that. Like, I will elaborate on what you mentioned. Like, so a uh, six-member all-woman Indian naval crew few years back circumnavigated the globe for eight months and they stopped at four places across that eight months, and one of that place was Christchurch. So, you know, you need to stop to put on ration and, you know, fuel and everything, check everything. So they were there for two weeks in Christchurch. I was in Christchurch based at that time. So all through the two weeks, everyone hosted them. Megan Woods hosted them, the mayor, Leanne hosted them, all the MPs hosted them, lots of Indian organization, community organization hosted them, facilitated them. Indian High Commission had an event, so I went everywhere. I wrote lots of stories. Except me, nobody, no other journalist attended any event, reported them. You, If you Google it, all the stories will be from Gaurav Sharma. You compare and you, you Google that, you Google another thing. You Google Dr. Patel, Christchurch GP, accused of sexually harassing his patients. And everyone, NZ Herald, RNZ, TVNZ stuff, you will find multiple stories on that. So I have no problem in people reporting about a Kiwi Indian GP sexually harassing his patients. That should be done. Everyone should do it. I have a problem when you do only that. Because, and I don't understand why you do only that. Because just imagine, it's not an Indian story, right? All of us work are working in our working life to have gen- gender parity in the world. If you do this story. It's not an inspiration only for Indian women. Just imagine young Kiwi girls in schools. They will, okay, oh, see those six women who they have circumnavigated the globe for the first time in history. Such an inspirational story. So I don't understand the logic. Just because they were Indians, you don't want to cover it, even if it has the potential to inspire your own women. It's not an Indian or a New Zealand story, right? It's a world story, which everyone should read about and inspire from. So, I mean, that demonstrates the difference that the... So, hopefully, now, with the again, I will go to Stuff. Now she is in charge. Maybe she'll change her editorial policy. <laughs> because Stuff, you know, press was owned by Stuff. And Stuff was there in Christchurch. I, uh, when, I, when they arrived and when they docked uh, in Christchurch, uh, Littleton Port was hosting them. And their PR manager was there. And she was talking to me. She said, invitation was sent to 20-something journalists. Only I was there. So 19 journalists in their wisdom or their editors in their wisdom thought this story is not worth covering. <laughs> so, I mean, on that, on a related topic, like when, you know, you're, you were, you had two years experience in India. Yeah, almost, um, yeah. And was it four or five? Five in, years in Five Singapore. years in Singapore. So you come to New Zealand, seven years experience as a, as a journalist. How, what, what, you know, you, you end up, effectively starting your own publications. What was your experience of uh, trying to, to basically take up work in which you were deeply experienced and when you, when you arrived here? Oh, that's uh, another... And I don't think my experience is uh, different from any other migrant that comes to New Zealand. But if you talk about my experience, it was... Like, I'll tell you, when I came here, I 
we have to admit that New Zealand doesn't matter so much in the world hierarchy, right? <laughs> that's so, a given. Yeah, that's Absolutely. a given. So when I came here, the John Key is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Except that I didn't know anything else about New Zealand. So obviously I had to, you know, like you were born and brought up here. So you have that institutional memory. I don't have that. So when I came here for six months and you have wonderful library system in New Zealand. So in Christchurch as well, it is there. So I for the first six months, I was... Uh, sitting in libraries, reading about New Zealand, everything, right? And you had some wonderful, now they are not publishing, but Listener, North and South, uh, NZ Today, lots of good magazines, right? So I was reading and learning about New Zealand. But I thought the better way is to like sitting with you, right? I will. I don't know what, what is important, what's not. So instead of spending hours and hours in library, if I have a cup of coffee with Duncan for two hours or one hour, he will be able to tell me, you know, okay, Labour and National, Green came and Green came only when MMP came and Ruth Richardson opened the economy and all that stuff, right? Which I didn't know. So I used to write to journalists, uh, senior journalists, and I used to say, okay, it's not about for a job. Uh, and uh, and add to that because I thought pe- as a journalist, people might be interested in what I have been doing. So I came to New Zealand in 2000, number 2018, and India had its general election in that very year when Modi became the prime minister. So for a publication in Singapore, I was in India for three, four months on the road covering Indian elections. So Indian elections is supposed to be the world's largest democratic exercise. I was on the road for like 10,000 kilometers. I was traveling through 10 states. So I had such massive experience, you know, in 2009 also, I have covered the elections uh, for Indian Express in 2014. So I thought if I talk to Duncan, I'm just using you as a prop now. So I said if I'm, I send an email to Duncan and I say, you know, I've just come to New Zealand and I have covered the largest democratic exercise in the world, which is awesome actually. You know, you remember first time we met, I told you that in India, they are so very particular about everyone should vote. That if at top of a hill, there is a single voter and for that voter to be able to vote, election commission officials will trek for 14 kilometers, go to that particular place and set up a voting booth so that that one voter is able to vote. Such such wonderful, I know we have lots of problems in Indian democracy as well, but there are problems and there are some wonderful things as well. So I thought Dunk, I will tell Duncan all this and Duncan might be interested. Nobody was interested. So for six months, I was doing that. I was sending emails. Firstly, just to have a cup of coffee to know, nobody replied. Then I start, okay, said, okay, fine, let me find. Uh, I knew that after six months, I knew a little bit about New Zealand. So I thought, okay, now let me apply for jobs or something. So that was in 2015. Nobody replied. But that story doesn't end there. The best part is it it keeps happening. And that's why I don't understand what is the problem with uh, the job scenario discrimination scene in New Zealand. Because, okay, in 2015, I was young so to say, young in New Zealand media business, right? Mm. So nobody responded. I understand that. Then I launched my Migrant Times. It became a successful newspaper. People said, make it a national newspaper. But making a na- starting something and then making it a national thing takes times, time, effort, energy, everything. So it took me, it was taking me some time to find investors and do that. So in 2016, I said, okay, Till I'm making, I'm able to make this a newspaper, national level newspaper. Let me find some other gigs here as well in Christchurch, right? So I used to write to new. So if I see, okay, this particular, I'm not going to embarrass people by naming them, but I'm just saying, like for example, if I'm if there is a NGO, and I say I they have a communication manager opening. So I'll write to that NGO. I will say, okay, fine, this is me. I have been uh, doing this migrant times here. And you probably, because everyone in Christchurch knew about the newspapers. I said, okay, you might have seen the newspaper somewhere. And I'm uh, right now looking for some other gig or something. So that's why I'm writing to you. Because I saw that opening. Mm -hmm. I'll get a reply. Oh, you were the editor. Such a wonderful newspaper. You did such a great job. And we'll get back to you. For two weeks, I will not hear anything. And then they will say, okay, sorry. You know, uh, uh, you have not been shortlisted. So I, I was surprised. You were so very happy. I'm not saying give me that job. I'm saying... I don't understand if you were so happy with that newspaper, you didn't even want it to meet me in person and just listen to me. What was my experience? Why did I want to launch Migrant Times and stuff like that? So that was the second time. So I thought, okay, there is something wrong in New Zealand. Then I came to Auckland. As I said, in um, in 2018, we launched this Multicultural Times, right? Similar thing happened last year as well when it was it was not publishing anything uh, or uh, we are not publishing and we were just doing online stuff. Again, I thought, let's let us look for other gigs. Right. So I started writing to people. 
and similar thing happened so i i was called to uh, big newsrooms with editors and when i was called the first thing i looked at was whether the person who is calling is a kiwi or not because in the last 5 years i have been so subconsciously it has been ingrained in me that a kiwi a pakeha is not going to call me for a job interview at all so if somebody is calling me that invariably means he is not from new zealand you know so again that then indian news happened so so i'm saying so it is not only when i arrived in new zealand i think it is it has been multiple times and this is not a unique story i must add in the end it is it happens with everyone so it happens in uh, whether you have kiwi experience so to say quote and quote it happens even if you have kiwi experience it happens even you have very rich kiwi experience The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makaurau, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt/cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. When we first met was um in the aftermath of um of March 15 of of last year and you know i remember uh, anjan raman um wrote a a story around the time about the feeling of you know representing um i think she's from the new zealand muslim women's league and and basically saying we are being surveilled we are you know we feel under threat from white supremacists speaking to government about their safety you know which is the fundamental duty of of a uh, a government is to you know you think that the first thing is safety and then you the rest becomes nice to have and and she was she wrote that so vividly um in the aftermath of it and and you know i think that it that for me sort of exposed what this um you know what the flow on consequences of if every institution has that same attitude that you just described um then yeah you know, ultimately those the, those are the stakes um is that is that that they get a different experience and, and 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 you know that's obviously the 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 single worst thing that that's that's happened in this country in, in my lifetime and and i i guess the what what i would I you know what I would like to ask you is is you know how that moment felt for the you know the the kinds of communities that you'd been writing about and whether you think that it has altered the sort of fundamental um you know DNA or the the posture of that sort of pakeha new zealand toward oh, not at all yeah. no. I, i don't think so it has altered anything i mean because i i i did a video a uh, few weeks back in which I, the response I, i only talked about the government response so we can elaborate on that um, as well as the community response as well but i think the government response to that very attack has been symbolic and shambolic nothing else i mean if you look at the christchurch call nothing nothing was ever going to happen uh because of that and it will not happen even i mean uh um if you look at all the outpouring of support and everything i mean all the stats by uh human rights commission and net safe tells us that the racist racist attack and everything has just increased because it's a more more polarized society so i don't think uh fundamentally anything will change by these Uh, shallow measures i think it will only change when we actually really get into the ground and start working on the younger generation i think it's very difficult uh, for anyone to change me and you 
I mean, we have to talk to the kids. So again, we did a piece in which we said that um, why can't we have something like from a directive from Ministry of Education? Like I always say this, you go to Christchurch, Auckland. So I always say Auckland and the rest. You should always talk about New Zealand in this term, the Auckland and the rest, not only in terms of property prices only. It should be about everything else as well. So Auckland is diverse, at least in uh, terms of percentage of population, not uh, the, not in sort of integration because in Auckland as, as well you have ghettos. We'll come to that later. But I'm saying so Auckland and the rest. So if you look at uh, South Island, you roam around South Island, you ask people what, what before March 2019, so you ask people what is Eid. They will not know what is Eid. So they will, so I, and my obvious question was, second question was, so but you know Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Isn't it a natural human obvious question that you will ask, okay, what is the fastest growing religion in the world? Islam. So what is the equivalent of Christmas in Islam? That is Eid, right? So that, but you roam around South Island and people will not know what is. So that's the homogeneity that we have in South Island. So uh, in our newspaper, Migrant Times, I was, uh, Rome, uh, you know the the what's the cat area around Catlins near Otago. I was just driving around that time, and uh, before that was sixteen seventeen two thousand sixteen seventeen. And in one of the petrol pump, I saw that white supremacist flag. I clicked a picture and I published that in my newspaper. That you know, New Zealand police, please wake up, just roam around, and you will see that. So at that time, there was oh, just a flag. And at that time is the obvious answer, just a flag. But now nobody will say it's just a flag, right? So people were waiting for something like this to happen to not say this is just a flag. That very flag in Christchurch, um, Santa Parade in 2015-16 during that time, was that very supremacist flag was flown on a monster truck. And Santa Parade is actually commissioned by city council. So at that time, Kaisa City Council also said that, you know, just a flag. In 2016, I interviewed the mayor. If you look at my interview, Leanne, she is still the mayor. One of the questions I ask is, in your, <laughs> your city, the rugby club is known as Crusaders. Don't you think there is something wrong in this? She said, no, it's just a name. I said, but I, when I go to watch the rugby matches and they flow their swords and all, it doesn't look like just a, they are actually talking about Crusade. She is just a name, right? But now everything is not just a name. But still, so all this I feel is symbolic. Nothing is going. So now nobody is flying that flag. But you don't see that integration that needs to happen. That can only happen when you start talking about uh, that integration in school. So when, as I said, the Ministry of Education can have a directive in which she, they can say that maybe just give a holiday like uh, I'm going to do a piece very soon in which I say, just look at the public holidays in New Zealand. Except Christianity, which religion has any representation? Every holiday is a Christian holiday. Or mm -hmm. you have Queen's birthday or something like that. Or if you look at any religious holiday, it is a Christian holiday, right? So if you you can have one for Diwali, a Hindu festival. You can have one for Eid, a Muslim festival. Maybe for Hanukkah, one Jewish fe festival. Right? So just three, four holidays. And you can reduce the two months of holidays that we have in December, January. Just reduce four days from that and give one holiday. So it's so when kids are sitting at home and you're, you, you have three daughters, right? When they uh, are sitting at home, obviously they will ask, okay, Papa, why am I not going to school today? You will say, because today is Diwali. Then the next question they will ask, okay, what is Diwali? That's how you educate people. But if they don't know what is Diwali, they will always grow up fearing Hindus and Muslims. So I feel uh, these, okay, opinions may differ. So I should say in my opinion, we should actually really start working at the ground with kids, with the younger people, so that the next generation gets to know the diversity in this society. Otherwise, like Phil Goff, the mayor, he keeps saying Auckland is the most diverse uh, city in the world, one of the most diverse. You you know uh, that guy, husband of Jenny Salesa, Minister Jenny Salesa, who is the pro-vice chancellor. Uh, he's w such a wonderful guy. I have heard him in few public uh, speeches. And he keeps saying that, you know, we have, even our schools are ghettos. So if you look, look go to a school, white flight, right? Everyone knows. You go to a school in South Island, you will, uh, South Auckland, you will see that the entire um, population of that school is either migrant, Asian, uh, Pakeha, uh, no, Maori or Pacifica, right? No Pakeha there. So even uh, Auckland and the rest, the rest is all, we need to work a lot in the rest. Even in Auckland where you have diversity, that integration is not there. So the response in summary that I have seen after the mosque attack, either by the government or by the community, you go to the community and ask people, 
there is no difference at all. That discrimination, that racism is still there. If at all, people will think, okay, it's not do- uh, diplomatically correct to say it in public. So they will not fly that flag. That's the only difference. That's pretty um, sobering. The, and, and I think that, that point you make about they won't fly the flag, but has what's in their heart changed or has their, um, you know, their, the, the overall social structures that, it, that sort of allowed that to happen changed. And I think one of the things that, that is different now um, and, and has been cited and is kind of evidence in the, the Christchurch call um, that you referred to before is the extent to which social media allows and even encourages people to kind of uh, both stay in particular communities, enables kind of communication and, and radicalization within those communities and um, and can prompt, uh, you know, and, and allows people to practice or, or even escalate their their sort of racism or Islamophobia or, or you know, you pick a, a form of hate. Um, the eco chambers of social media. Yeah. yeah. Did, have you noticed in your time as a journalist, um, I read an amazing story in, in Wired about um, the sort of the power of WhatsApp in uh, in Modi's India in, in terms of driving the the rise of um, sort of Hindu nationalism and, and sort of concurrent uh, uh, sort of Islamophobic sentiment there. Have you noticed that um, you know in in your time that 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 is a driving force, or how how has that impact? No, that's I mean uh, that's definitely a big factor. My country, I call India my country, right? Because my country is very polarized now. And that is, in fact, a large part of that is due to the rise of uh, Hindu nationalism in the last five, six years, ever since Narin Modi became the prime minister. But since it's a pro- polarized uh, state of affairs, so whatever good also he does gets polarized. Mm-hmm. And no, nobody is able to appreciate whatever good he dumps, does sometimes. But one of the fallout is definitely that it's a very divided society. And like, for example, just uh, two days back, he extended one of uh, his schemes, a Garib. Uh, so it's like a, a free uh, distribution of uh, grains, food grains yep. to majority of 80 crore something, you know, 800 million something Indians or not, right? So he extended that. So even while extending that, I'll give you one example, even in speeches, he, he extended that and he said, I'm extending it till Diwali. So that people till Diwali are able to feed themselves. Then uh, in, there is a, a state in India called Bihar, so elections are coming up in Bihar. So they have a big festival around Diwali's time. It's called Chhat. So he mentioned, okay, so so that people in Bihar in Chhat is also able to celebrate Chhat with their stomachs full, right? So now uh, lots of people like me said, but Eid is also coming, right? So in his speech, he could have said, okay, because Diwali is in October, November. Eid is near before mm. that, right? Mm. So he could have said, and I am, so that during Eid also, you know, my Muslim brothers are able to celebrate Eid with their stomach full, but he didn't say that. So I'm saying even things like that, because, I mean, he could, he, at a time like this, when country is so polarized, it, dip, it it's it's all, the onus is on the leader of the country to bring the country together. But even in small things like that, he, he in his mind, it doesn't struck that I should say uh, Diwali is coming, Eid is coming, Chat is coming and every Indian should be able to go to sleep with a stomach full, something like that. So, I mean, I'm just giving an example that it is so deep rooted in our society that somehow, you know, last year we did a page one story on that. Uh, I don't know whether you're aware, but I'll explain like CA and RC was a big issue in India. So, uh, Modi government uh, amended the citizenship uh, bill, right? The citizenship, so, so, but disenfranchised. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. In, I'm now there are different school of thoughts. There's so not so those who are opposed to it, they are saying no, it's not d- disenfranchising, right? Mm. Modi government is saying no, no, we are not taking. It's not about taking anybody's voting rights away. It's about giving voting rights to refugees from Pakistan, Afghanistan who are Hindus, right? So that's their explanation. But there is so much distrust yeah. that 
nobody is believing that. So the protests are going on in New Zealand. Also, it happened. I think this Sunday it's happening again. Yeah. So I mean, and that that sense of sort of social media f- fueling political polarization and almost. You know, what you're really seeing is algorithms which respond to uh, basically are, are engineered toward interaction. Interaction happens at the extreme. Something that you just sort of noddingly agree with disappears from feeds. And so, but it feels like that is, you know, we're seeing that manifested in in our politics everywhere is that they're almost like, uh, algorithmically engineered politicians, um, and and you see it in in media too. And which stories are selected, which stories are, are emphasised, are those which explode on social media because they have a particular dynamic, and it probably explains why you're, you know, in part, in part explains why your um, Indian woman sailors receive far less coverage yeah. than. Um, the, you know, the the sexually harassing GP, the the politician who, to my mind, seems like the most unpleasant vector for that in New Zealand, particularly as it pertains to the Indian community, is uh, Shane, Shane Jones. Jones. <laughs> um, you've written about him uh, for us, and, um, and and you know he he's probably the single person who's the cl- come closest to having Ardern properly address you know, the elephant in the room in terms of the divisions between uh, Labour and New Zealand first. To, talk to me about Shane Jones and his, his comments and how that landed with you and, and your community. So, I mean, obviously everyone agrees. Leave alone me. I So New Zealand first uh, had a Kiwi Indian MP from 2014 to 17, Mahesh Bindra. So I got a chance to talk to him for the first time ever since this Shane Jones comments coming started one year back. So that was the first time Brinda fronted up. And the first thing I asked him is this, leave alone me. I mean, Bindra, who is his own party colleagues and probably he'll be in the list again and whatever. Right? He uh, stood for elections in Mount Roskill uh, in 14 and 17 as well. So I said, did you have the chance to talk to Shane Jones about what he has been saying about the Indian county? And Bindra said, no, <laughs> no. For the last one year, Shane Jones is saying so much, but Bindra didn't even bother to talk to him. So obviously, and so Bindra agrees, everyone agrees that th- those comments are uh, probably uh, their own internal uh, power struggle. Nobody knows what, I- what is happening with New Zealand First because uh, those comments don't help anyone. To that extent, uh, if you look at the uh, last two issues of Indian News, in the last issue, Gaur, my namesake, Dr. Gaurav Sharma, who is standing from Hamilton West. He, in the last two last issues, he I interviewed him. He's told me that I faced racism in 2017 and I'm fearful that I will face it again this time. Mm. That was two weeks back. Just last week, his campaigning started and he has been called a curry candidate, quote unquote, right? So he said, see, I just told you and this has been happening. So I'm saying politicians like Shane Jones, of course, I will give one uh, I credit to him. After that, he fronted up to one of the Indian organization and he gave an interview and one veteran Indian journalist, Venkat Raman, interviewed him and he talked to him. So he did front up to the community. And Venkat Raman, a very decent man, he invited him to, you know, the Indian festivals as well and everything. So he did front up. But I don't see that those comments are anything else, just plain simple politics. One thing that I differ on and probably uh, uh, we will write something about that in future as well, that somehow and uh, the mainstream or the already established media in New Zealand has this tendency of singling out Shane Jones because they somehow feel that it makes them feel nicer about them to single out one person and say that, okay, Shane Jones is the only one who is talking which is quote-unquote racist about Indian community, and everything else is fine. The fact is, and that's what I said, maybe we'll write that in future, from 2002 to 2017, on an average, New Zealand First has gotten 7% of New Zealand's vote. Sometime in 2008, it was 4.8, otherwise 11%, 7% like that. Average is 7%. So whatever Shane Jones has been, or in effect, his party has been doing, saying, or believes in 7% of New Zealand's population in the last two decades agree with them. So my assertion to everyone in the media business in New Zealand is 
singling out Shane Jones is not right. He is just catering to his 7%. So if you want to single out, you should single out 7% of your own population. But see the magic. Singling out word person is okay because you can always say only one. But suddenly, if you say 7% of our population is actually believing that Indians, Indian students have, you know, what is happening. Everyone is saying open up the borders. So the value of international students is being recognized now in the post-COVID economy of New Zealand, right? But what he was saying, Indian students have come to New Zealand and ruined everything, right? Did they ruin everything? Then why are you saying open up your borders and bring them back, right? So my only assertion is I don't have that... Uh, 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 that feeling against Shane Jones because I feel that Shane Jones is just doing his politics which is being approved by 7% of the population. I know the polls are one point, putting them at 1.8 and less than 2%. So I don't know what's going to happen this time. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, they understand that that 2% might stick. And in the uh, just to tell you this issue, I got, uh, a, uh, we approached the PM and we said that, you know, this is going to be election season. Your candidates are being called curry candidates. What's your message to other political parties? So as was expected, she said, no racism. I encourage everyone to uh, refrain from that. Hopefully New Zealand First will listen to that. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and I think the points you make that uh, in some ways, at least, you know, Shane Jones appalls me, but he he says it up front rather than by word and by deed and by sort of mass behavior doing it in a million subtle ways. And, and he's a politician, it. right? He's a yeah. politician. So if he's doing that, his feedback from the community must be, yes, yes, this is right, this is right. Yeah. So he's just catering to the 7%. So why are we villainizing Shane Jones? If we want to villainize, if at all we can, we should villainize the vote base of New Zealand first, right? Mm. So Yeah, it's just... New Zealand, yes, you know. Yes, New Zealand. <laughs> um, hey, well, that's um, that's our hour. Thank you so much for yeah. coming up, Godov, <laughs> and um, for for speaking with me. And I think there's there's just a whole lot in there for both. And my pleasure. That was the fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of the fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Hello for Lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spin-Off. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spin-Off member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.